thank you, Kelsey, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I will, uh, yeah, I'll spend a second just give you some context on me. I think, uh, you know, Kelsey much needs, needs much less explanation. Um, so I've been investing for the last seven years. I invest with a firm called Vertex Ventures. We are infrastructure software specialists. And so that's everything that we are thinking about and working in. Um, we have a very small, very focused portfolio, very strong in infrastructure software. So companies like Docker, like LaunchDarkly, Hasura, and Gitpod. Uh, very small, very focused, and we spend a deep amount of time with the companies that we work with. We're investing from inception to series A. Um, and so that's Vertex. Uh, I think a key thing that helps explain why I'm here and speaking to Kelsey and helped co-chair this event is that we're infrastructure software specialists, but we're also go-to-market specialists. And so we help technical founders build technical go-to-markets from scratch. And so Kelsey is advising a number of our companies and, and helping them work on that specific thing. And that's everything that we think about. So that's really fed into how me and Kelsey were both thinking about what's going to be really valuable in our sessions today. And also what I would like to spend some time, some quality time with Kelsey that I think we, we rarely get uh, specifically focused on this topic of how he advises companies and how he, from his very unique perspective of working with startups on one side, VCs on the other side, and actually enterprise leaders and large enterprise organizations on the other side. It's a very unique, neutral position that you have working across all of these things and not having an agenda, a specific agenda on like how you want these things to play. And I think it's, it's a unique perspective. And I think our audience of hopefully lots of founders can, can learn a lot from that. Um, I've been talking for a long time. I think what people will probably most want to know is, you know, how, how do you decide to work with the companies that you work with? What is it that gets you excited about them? You know, you gave me this dope compliment uh, about two years ago when we first started doing this. When I was leaving Google, I had built up all this expertise. I made it to distinguished engineer at a company with hundreds of thousands of employees. There's like a hundred or so of them. And a lot of my work has been open source based. And when you're leaving, when you're retiring from the big game, you're asking like, what do I do with myself? Do you just trash all this knowledge? Do you just go live on an island? And you gave me this dope compliment. You said you are the VC whisperer. <laughs> You, you are. You, you, you have all of these things that you just mentioned. And so when I thought about advisory, how many founders are here? If you've ever had an advisor, sometimes the advisor goes like this, famous person, you put their name on the website, and then that's the last you hear of them, right? They give you advice like, you should probably charge more for this product, and we would probably make more money, then they disappear. And so my rules were, if I couldn't work with the team or founder, and our work doesn't result in a better project that you can touch. So if you walk to one of the founders that I'm working with and say, what have you and Kelsey built together? They should be able to explain very clearly. Not that I'm always right, but there should be some work that's being done to address the target market. And so my number one thing is, can I actually help? And what I mean by help is, we ship something that people want to pay for. That's my criteria. So it would be cool if we built more stuff for free. That's not literally my agenda as an advisor trying to help someone mature and grow their business. That's my number one criteria. And so that means you talk to the founder, you talk to the product person, you talk to the engineers, and you meet them all and say, hey, can I work with you and make things better here? And so that's just the number one criteria. And if I can't do that, you just want my face on the website, that's not good for either of us. 100%. And just for some additional background context on the power of Kelsey advising these companies, in the last week alone, I've had two founders, kind of Series B stage founders, pretty mature founders, uh, come up to me excitedly, and I won't mention names, come up to me excitedly and say, Kelsey Hightower has just agreed to be one of our advisors. Like unprompted, nothing to do with the conversation we're having this week. They have just independently come up to me and told me that because of the genuine value that Kelsey has been delivering and, and working with companies on. So yeah, one of those is our portfolio, one of our portfolio companies, and so I'm, I'm very excited to have you working with them. There's another question that, that comes up sometimes, which is, how do I know if it's going to work? I don't know. I've seen too many things that shouldn't work work. I've seen too many things that should work not work. It, there's so many factors involved in this. Some people just have an ugly logo. <laughs> people just don't like the logo. I don't know what to tell you. 
The name is dumb. No one likes the logo. The product is great. They just can't rock with the logo. And sometimes that's just a thing, and I don't even know to tell them that. And so there's a lot of nuance into this. So the only approach that I really take about this is anything can work. And one thing that I learned the most at CoreOS, I remember the founder there, Alex Povey, Brandon Phillips, they had their first startup, and they sold it to Rackspace, a company called CloudKick. And when they started CoreOS, and there were so many things I liked about CoreOS that drew me to that particular company. I was using their products, etcd, everything was written and going. I was drawn to it as someone who would potentially pay for this stuff. But when I got there, I was like, hey, what's the secret to this? He was like, you just got to survive. You got to do this long enough to see if the vision plays out. And you just have to do what's necessary. For some people, you need 10 years to make this happen. So you do have to survive. And that means paying attention to the market, figuring out revenue where it comes. Sometimes you may have to do a little pro services to give you a little bit more runway so you can see the vision play out. And so now I don't judge as much anymore because it's very easy for an outsider to say that won't work for this long list of reasons. It could work, and here's how I could help. That's my new criteria. And so I guess taking on from that, what are some common pitfalls that you see companies experiencing kind of maybe wandering into without meaning to, what are some things that you see time and time again that you wish you could prevent or find yourself helping people work through more often than not? This is the number one. It doesn't work. It literally doesn't do the thing the website says. You spend all this time on this beautiful website, you get all the words right, it may be even your vision. And what I tend to find that in 10 minutes, I can just say, hey, don't show me anything. I just go to the website as a user that wants to give you money. First thing is, some of y'all make it very impossible to give you money. I literally just want to give you money. <laughs> Call for sales. It's like, I got my credit card right here. <laughs> your product's only $10. What am I going to call and talk about? You can buy a car online <laughs> with a credit card. Your $10 a month service should be really easy to acquire. Step one, most people have never thought about their product or service from the customer perspective. If you say that your product is better than another product, have you put them side by side? It literally doesn't work. If I'm a person coming from product X, you know what my mindset is. So I'm going to be looking for docs that say, if you're coming from X, this is what you do here. I want to see the vocabulary translation. Does it even install easily? You'll be surprised. People have these beautiful products, and you can't install it. This is the number one problem that I wish I could prevent. When I was at Google, I started this thing called Empathetic Engineering Program, where engineers that work on schedulers and Kubernetes, they have never installed Kubernetes before. And you have to sit those people down that run the company and say, we're going to use your product today with this brand new laptop. And then you just watch things unfold that, huh, you have no on-ramps. So if you're going to build a business, you need to have an on-ramp into the product. Whoever you think your target customer is, there has to be a clear on-ramp to that particular product. So some of the biggest wins I've ever had, I won't mention the company name, but we made a small pivot. We added a simple on-ramp. We had this user day, it was all virtual. I did a small demo of what this on-ramp was because that's my belief in the target audience. Interviewed the founders, had a couple of customers show up, and they got purchased by New Relic the next day. That's how I was like, oh, I might be good at this. The company got purchased or the software got they purchased? They got purchased, the whole company. Oh, wow. <laughs> they had an exit. That was the founder's goal. That was the VC's goal. In order to get that, we had to have a clear strategy like how this would get adopted. And so that would be my number one thing. Does it work? And I'm not saying this like, can you get it to work if you call the right people? Does it work? And if you've never done this before, just find a potential customer, watch them install your product without you saying a word. If they cannot do this and use your product, it doesn't work. Just make it work. And then we can iterate on that. I guess some, some really important feedback there. Something we talk about a lot as investors almost preach about is that we're looking for founders with customer obsession. And it's a very loaded term. But I think tactically, the way that's presented is exactly doing those things. Sitting in front of your customers, caring about your customers, thinking about you know, how are they really using this? What are some 
why, why do you think that's happening for, for technical founders particularly? I think most would say in this room, of course, I'm obsessed with my customers. Of course, I'm, I'm building this company for my customers. What do you think it is that, that's kind of, that, where do you think that mismatch comes from? Where, you know, for some reason, they're not prioritizing customers in that way. So a lot of founders I work with is like, hey, you know, let me see the prospective customer list. Who are we trying to close? What's the list of the targets? Like, hey, we got this customer using our product. I was like, why are you calling them a customer? They give you no money. They're not a customer. <laughs> They're using the product for free. So we got to reserve that vocabulary for where it's appropriate. If it's a customer, they exchange money for project or for, for a product. And so for me, I asked them, say, hey, look at this list. We need to go on a field trip to the customer. Like, no, we do virtual meetings with the three people. They're big fans of us, but they have no money. When you go on the field trip to the customer, you walk through their doors, you look at their cubicles, you watch how they work, and then you see the other 50 people who really do the hard work. That even if the other three people buy the product, the other 47 will be forced to use. Talk to them, get on the whiteboard. The number one question, what are you currently doing? Just listen. Whiteboard, take a picture of the whiteboard. And then try to ask yourself, does our product help them or not? Then prove it. If your customer accepts, so when I say I'm obsessed with the customer, the story I like is we got them into production. The first big deal I helped close at Google from an engineering perspective, the customer invited me to an all hands to celebrate the signing of the agreement. I'm like, I've never had a customer throw a party to pay us money. <laughs> but the customer was so excited because of the problem we actually solved that they were like, we finally did the thing. Every dollar we paid was worth its weight in gold. So I meet a lot of founders that have never visited a customer. The easiest thing you can do in the very beginning, if you have zero customers, take one customer and go visit them. When I was at CoreOS, I was like, who's using our stuff? And I would see the list of like, Google will search, their office is around the corner. I would email and say, hey, I'm in town, can I just drop by? And you would go in and say, like, hey, how are you using CoreOS? And they would show us all these things, and what I would hear is all the reasons why they're not paying us. I would just hear it, and I would come back to the office and say, hey, I know why they're not paying us. This is what's missing. Or you can just ask the question, you wanna hear it? This is the question you can ask. It's like, it will save you like a trillion dollars in market research. <laughs> what would you pay for? So you got a database project, right? It's dope. You use like the best database ever. New SQL does all these things. And you ask the customer, what would you pay for? I will pay if you can migrate this stuff from Oracle into that thing. I will literally pay you. Like, what should we build? I know. The thing they'll pay for. <laughs> Right, so to just keep this in perspective. So that was my number one thing. So if your customer is obsessed, you should be able to prove it. So if a VC asks, how are your customers going? We just visited JP Morgan on their home turf and we met new champions and we found a new workload for a potential product. Here's how our roadmap has adjusted from some of these customer meetings. Now I'm gonna preview these with, with a caveat with one more thing. Do not allow that customer to dictate your entire product. That's a mistake. One big customer can derail your whole company. So you gotta be careful, but you should at least have this part of your motion. And you can do this when you're first starting out. Sometimes you can call them design partners, but they become customers when they, when they pay you. There's something I'll, I'll, I'll labor the point on there because I think it's really powerful. I think a symptom of being truly customer obsessed is when your customers are obsessed with you. And that exactly having that party you know, for Google, uh, for them paying you money and really like celebrating because you've served them so well and you've really listened to them. Uh, I think that's something that's really powerful. It's something, definitely something to aim for. Um, maybe switching tax a little bit, you know, you've... I'm gonna do a tick, qu tick, uh, quick time check. We're gonna go to a couple audience questions. Mm. We're gonna practice. Because some of the founders you definitely gonna wanna talk to and ask questions. So we're gonna practice now. If anyone has a question, there's this thing called a microphone. You can get out of your chair, you can walk to it. This is what you do when you're in person. We're not online. You can ask questions in person. Who wants to try this thing? Come on, come on, come on, come on, you go first. That's what I like. How's it going? 
Introduce yourself, ask your question. Andy Donnell, not a founder. I have lots of ideas swirling around in my head. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about often is when is the wrong time or the right time to go to VC? Like when, when is the time to take this thing that I'm tinkering with in my home lab and say, I need to scale and I want to turn this into something I can sell and, and start to get advice from folks like you? You know what, Megan, I'm going to let you answer that first. Because I also get asked this question a lot. I was like, Kelsey, could you advise my company? Like, you don't even have a business license. You, you don't have a company yet. <laughs> but I'll let you start because you, you probably hear this all day. Yeah, I think uh, business license and, uh, you know, an idea of a company for sure. But um, being, being more specific, I think just being really clear on what is the, what is the co commercial business that you want to build? What is something that you can deliver uniquely that a class of customers may pay you for, and I say may pay you for, in that some examples of things you can use, like, hey, I've spoken to 50 platform engineering leaders or platform engineers at large companies, and the one thing I'm hearing from them, from them is that they are spending way too much money on X. And I have an idea that I think I could make that a little easier for them, or I could actually improve that a lot. Um, and I, <laughs> and I, uh, and I, sorry, <laughs> laughing at Liam in the back. Um, and that's, that's when you've got the seed of a business versus, oh, I bought something for free. I think people like it. You know, why, why do people like it? It's just really asking that like, customer why. I think that's, it can be really early. We're investing in inception stage companies that have been building for four weeks, but can sit down and have an open conversation about, this is the class of people who really need what I'm building. And me as a VC, I can go to people I know and have close relationships with who are leading platform engineering organizations and say, hey, I'm hearing this is a problem. Is this something you're spending money on? And the moment when I hear back that they say, yeah, you know what, that is a problem. And no one's, no one's really figuring that out for me. That's the moment when the company can be four weeks old, the company can be two weeks old. That's when I'm like, ooh, okay, let's, let's put some money behind this and see if we can build a business around it. Um, yeah. I would say the one thing I've seen work really well is a lot of founders come from companies they work at. I built the thing. Our company used to pay $10 million a year for iPhone telemetry. We cut that bill down by 80%. I know for a fact all of our peers doing similar things are in the same situation. And you might be in a situation where you were able to open source it before you leave. You got it vetted, the code's like there, but maybe the whole product isn't there. So there's a potential to monetize and you wanna build a business around it. I think that makes a very strong argument because you know it can solve that problem. And the reason why I'm taking this particular angle on this question, we're at KubeCon. There's a lot of open source projects that have gotten good head starts. They have nice communities behind them. And a lot of people involved in those projects, it's not always the creators of those projects that in start the businesses. Sometimes it's someone who thinks a business should exist around this project and they're willing to step up and not just be a maintainer contributing code, but to be an entrepreneur that will build a business around it. And I think at that moment is where it's like, hey, is there a business here? What is that? Uh, the other question I like, uh, I remember I was helping someone with their pitch deck and a VC just gave them the ultimate gotcha question. They were trying to raise, let's call it $5 million. And the VC said, what would you do with 100 million? And they had no answer. And it's like, well, that VC used that to try to figure out whether they were thinking about this as a long-term game or not. Not that I need to give you 100 million to start out because that's too much money for companies sometimes at that stage. But I think as someone that's going to try to build a business, what would you do if you had the right people? What would you do if you had 5 million, 10 million, 20 million? What would you do if you became the CEO of your biggest potential competitor? Like these are things to think about as you're crafting that business out. And then you go and say, is VC the right tool? Right, and we haven't talked about that a lot. I don't know if VC is the right tool for every business that needs to exist. There are a lot of great businesses that don't raise any money because they know what lane they want to swim in, right? So we don't all have to go that route. What's the time? I don't want to make sure we go too far over. We're at 48, so we've got a few minutes left. We've got a few minutes left. All right, we'll do another question, then we'll let you, we'll do two more, and then we'll let you wrap up. Yeah, yeah. But we'll do you three. One, two, three. We're going to do it fast. Coming from all. Nice. Yeah. I'm coming all the way from uh, Toronto. Um, 
So I started as a system admin, same as you. Um, I started uh, learning uh, Kubernetes in 2016, 2018, just by seeing your Kubernetes at the v, uh, GitHub repo. And I'm a cube standard now. So going from starting from a system admin to uh, DevOps engineer, site developer engineer, and then our platform engineer, custom engineer now. So uh, I, I've been in this industry for 17 years, uh, IT industry. So what I uh, see uh, in the market right now is the enterprises uh, think enterprise product is the best place to go, and then they don't uh, support open source products right? because they think like their lack of support or something like that, and uh, maybe like even like uh, enterprise products fail, right? Like for example, CrowdStrike and other problem, uh, other product companies fail as well, and then like try to fix it. So what do you say for that uh, thing? Like they say like like none of the product is perfect. I would say. Um, so every product has its own uh, pros and cons. Um, so what what do you think, like from like a open source versus enterprise uh, product, or like from a startup companies? Like when we go and then say, okay, we are build this cool product, which is equal to an enterprise product, but we are giving it for free, or we are giving it at low cost. Then 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 they think, and then they think that um, they 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 are suspicious basically. Like they think, okay. Something they are doing behind the scene, like they're giving it for free, maybe some. Let, let me summarize it. Look, you're trying to penetrate existing markets where there's enterprise software players that charge a lot of money, yeah. make great margins. They're in there. They're staples. Yeah. So the first question is, why would I leave that for you? I think the people yeah. in the data space have the hardest challenge. Oracle works. If I get sued, Oracle will be there with lawyers. I ask you, do you have legal counsel? You're like, how do you spell that? <laughs> so you're not ready for that enterprise motion at all, cool. right? Because with the, they're not literally just buying software. They're buying insurance policies. Yeah. That sales cycle is very mature. And so you have to understand that. And this is why you have to kind of work towards that. Because enterprise, everyone says enterprise, enterprise, like stop playing. That's a different game. Yeah. Right? This is why people lean on existing vendors literally to just provide the exact same thing your company does. Even if you're better. Hey, I'd rather buy that from Cisco. Right? And this is why some of the acquisitions happen this way. Because a lot of times that matchmaking between your technical expertise and your ability to do business with the enterprise, there's a little mismatch. I think the thing that's been challenging that we're not going to go too deep in because of time, but the reason why people like buying their software through cloud providers, because sometimes that's the missing element. Like when I was at CoreOS, I remember doing the first sale. We didn't even have contract paperwork. Okay. We are online trying to find a template <laughs> to email to someone. You're like, what the hell are we doing here? They knew we weren't serious. So you just got to think about when we say selling to an enterprise, have you ever worked at an enterprise? Yeah, I work Think for, about how you buy software in an enterprise. Yeah, yeah. I do like uh, contact vendors when you're choosing a product. So I've been in that stage. So I would say this. This would be my advice. Find one enterprise customer. Go through the full procurement process. Yeah. Go through the full security audit process. Yeah, I've been in that phase. Yeah, and so, once you get yeah. all that stuff documented, then it's easier for the next enterprise that's going to ask you for the same yeah, 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 yeah. list. So that's just a different game. It's yeah. a different motion, and that's more about business yeah. than purely about is your product better or not. But sometimes a better product does get you to the table where they decide if you can do business with them or not, if you're mature enough or not. We'll go to one more, then we've got to take a break yeah. for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. You got it. All right. Last question before a break, and then we're going to come back for this next panel. All right. Hey, I'm Joe. Uh, we've actually met before, so it's great to see you again, Kelsey. Um, so I think that this is a good follow-up to that. And uh, so, you're, so uh, the last... Uh, question was about uh, penetra penetrating that enterprise market. But how do you, uh, beyond that, how do you advise people to overcome the hump of being the small player? And the, the, the context of that is that I have wanted to purchase software and I've had it shut down by other decision makers within my org because they say, that guy is too small. And even though I was like, no, he has a really good product, I really want it. So how do you, how do you uh, advise people on overcoming that hump? So remember that thing I told you about the field trips? When I was at CoreOS, I would do the field trips. I would come in, I would talk to the executive team. Let me just be very clear about what the field trip means. You're going to be there for four hours. The day's going to start about eight. You got to give them two month lead time so you can get time with the executive team. You can't get time with the executive team with a week ahead of time. You can't just be dropping by because the execs ain't going to be there. Their admin will get you time on the calendar. 
You can't come in there talking about hello world technical stuff. You gotta be talking hello revenue. Hey, I've talked to your team. <laughs> Jesse over there working on mainframe COBOL jobs. He spends 40 hours of his time doing JIRA tickets. Our product turns that into 10. You have this many employees doing that. All they hear is hello revenue. I hear something here. And they're gonna bring their technical counterpart. They're gonna look over, is he lying? He's telling the truth. Uh, we can probably do business. Nice to meet you, because they're gonna give you 20 minutes tops. They're out of there. They'll remember, this person knows what they're talking about. They didn't come here and say a bunch of jargon, because a lot of executives hate feeling dumb, even if they are. <laughs> so you gotta create this vibe of like, hey, I'm here to be a partner. And then as you move down the day in the meeting, you're looking at a product team. What are you currently doing? Man, this is a bunch of corn shell scripts, bro. We bought Terraform, we bought Puppet, we bought Ansible, and we never used them. Oh, so you bought all the things. So when you ask to buy my thing, you've already lost trust to get another PLC going because y'all never finished anything, right? So that's that team. They ain't got no money. They're on probation. You go to the next team, they rocking it out. We write the corn shell. We're the king. We're the only team that gets things done. So you're like, oh, okay. So I gotta work with Corn Shell probably. Or I gotta start with them and figure out what's next. So you go back to the office, it's four hours. You go back to the team and say, hey, we gotta leave with ProServe. I gotta come train that team that never finishes anything. We gotta give them a free four hour workshop where we literally get it into production. And so now it's like affinity, so you're gone now. Hey, what'd you think about that team? Man, I haven't learned anything new in the last five years until these folks showed up. I'm feeling good. I think I can get the project done. The corn shell guys are like, they even came with corn shell bindings. No one ever comes with corn shell bindings. <laughs> you see what I mean? You see what happens? Yeah. So now when that, that tension shows up, it's like, hey, are they too small? They're like, look, we already got this thing running in production, so I think you're going to want to buy this license because we can rip it out and wait six months, or you can keep it in and just pay them. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's that tactical. Yep. You don't get the thing of like, I work at Google. Oh, Google just cut the check, man. Put it in our enterprise agreement. <laughs> you ain't got that. Yeah. That's it, that's the game. Hey, thank you all for hanging out with us for this fireside chat. The day is gonna progressively get deeper and deeper and deeper. And I want y'all to rock out with this. So we're gonna take a quick 10 minute break or so. We're gonna come back. We have some VCs tell us the lays of the land. S everything you wanna know about fundraising and all those things. Then we're going to be hearing from Scott Johnson from Docker, who turned a project that we thought was going to go out of business into a money machine. We're going to hear from one of my favorite people, Adam Jacobs, that talks about the real decisions you have to make as someone who's ran a business for over a decade, things that a lot of us probably use but refuse to pay for. Some of us that chose to pay for it and had to struggle to find value, I think he spent the decade synthesizing this idea between license changes, what you give away from free, and what you force people to buy and make them smile for it. There's gonna be a lot of insight in the next set of talks, so make sure you come back. So let's go take that break. Appreciate y'all.